What's up everyone, just a little quick one, so for some reason my mic wasn't turned on or I was recording through my camera mic or something on this episode, so the sound quality on my end is not as good as it should be, but it is a brilliant episode, so please, if you are listening, stick around because my guest Phil really, really says some pretty enlightening things, so please don't click off just because of my error. Anyway... I hope you enjoy the podcast and I'll see you on the next one. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Point podcast. Today we are here with Phil. Phil, I don't know your surname because it doesn't say it on um, TikTok. It's Lunt, L-U-N-T. Phil Lunt and Phil yeah, is a coach and a, a neuroscience psychologist graduate, which we're going to get into the sort of things that he speaks about on TikTok, which is how we met. And I think there is a lot of interesting questions and topics that we can talk about. So how are you doing today, Phil, in the sunny... Yeah, not so bad. I'm doing all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a nice sunny day. How about where you... You're you're just... You're somewhere in England, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Surrey. Yeah, yeah. So it's nice there too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's very, very, very hot and very sunny today. So that's good. So, Phil, let's start off by talking about, give a little brief synopsis on your background and how you ended up doing what you're doing now and what you do maybe outside of the TikTok videos. Okay, I don't know how you know, how long we got. Um, yeah, it's true. I won't go into too much detail, but um, I, I, um, I got CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, about 10 years ago maybe 12 years ago now, something like that. It's, it's seemed to, um, and then I ended up going to, I ended up, I realized it was a stress-based thing and I went, ended up going to an MBSR thing, a mindfulness-based stress reduction course. And um, it really helped me. And then the woman who ran it said, oh, you might like this because she knew I was into science. I used to be a chemistry teacher. And uh, she gave me this book called, um, what was it called? The, the Buddha's Brain by Rick Hansen. It's a really good book about this neuroscientist who, did all this research into neuroscience of meditation and stuff like that. And I was just blown away by it. I was like, wow, this is like, this is what I want to get into. So I, I just learned all this stuff. I got, got rid of all my anxiety. I was rid of all the anxiety recovered from that recovered from CFS mostly. Um, and then I thought I want to try and help other people. So I did, a, I, and I started doing workshops in on stress and things like that just locally. Um, and then I felt like I had a bit of imposter syndrome, so I thought I'd better get some some uh, some certificates. So I got a master's, did a master's in, at King's College in neuroscience and psychology and mental health. And then I just, and then I wanted to do lots of different coaching so I could, you know, help people practically. So I did, a, uh, sorry, lots of different training. I did uh, coaching training uh, with a company called Barefoot. And I did training in parts work, so voice dialogue and EFT, like tapping. Yeah. And what else do I do? Some other training. Loads of training. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then so let's let's go back a little bit then. So what were you doing prior to the diagnosis? What do you think when you talk about it was uh sort of brought upon by stress? What was sort of going yeah, on? Yeah. So I I I still run a holiday big holiday. I used to run two big holiday homes. Um, sleeping like 30 people each. Um, I, I still run one and it, but it's a very, very, it's a family home and it was really, really run down and, and very, very stressful. Um, yeah. lots of complaints and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of my bread and butter work, but my real interest like, is, is in neuroscience and psychoeducation, psychology, uh, coaching. So when, when you were, um, so given given the diagnosis how how did that make you feel at the time and, and what did what was the sort of prognosis in terms of going forward and how did you think your life was gonna sort of continue mm. not continue yeah life? well yeah yeah it was tough yeah it was really really tough like anyone who's got chronic fatigue or knows someone with it is it's not pretty like it's it's, it's a very difficult thing and when i got diagnosed probably a year or two after getting it. it. In a way, it was a relief because like, well, I know what is wrong with me now. 
But at the same time, I knew that there was no cure as such, you know, from the NHS, no pill you could take. Um, so it was it was difficult, quite dark, dark times, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, through meditation and all the different things I learned, all the skills and tools I learned, um, like t dozens and dozens of books I read, um, I got out of it. And, and, and like I said, I was suffering a lot with anxiety back then as well. And I completely got, got out of that. I got over it. I got over the CFS and then, and then when COVID came, I got COVID and, and, and really bad COVID and, oh, and I, I got ill again. I did, my body just went crashed again. So I got back into CFS about two years ago. I'm only yeah. just coming back out of that now. Wow. But it's been a lot quicker this time around because I know what to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. COVID, you know, we, we know sort of the state of COVID and I always think, I feel like COVID had some kind of ability to, uh, hone in on individuals' weaknesses and almost exaggerate them and, and target you at your weakest point is, is what I experienced because I had it twice, um, mm. in theory twice, but certainly once. The first time I was exceptionally physically ill and then the second time I was very mentally ill in the sense that I just felt, I think I had long COVID and that sort of prolonged mental malaise over me that was quite mm. damaging and difficult to navigate so is chronic fatigue basically is is me are they the same thing me and chronic fatigue yeah so basically, someone yeah. that's got me mm -hmm. yeah um and yeah. i can imagine when you say that anxiety you're incredibly anxious i mean anxiety is such a debilitating and draining state to be in so <sighs> Yeah. yeah exactly so it's horrible it's horrible yeah. yeah it really is really horrible um so how did you and, I, and it makes sense how when you were able to uh limit the anxiety the uh the chronic fatigue ameliorated itself to some degree so that's really good how did you what sort of things were you anxious about what, what yeah for me like so, I mean, there's there's lots of different types of anxiety. Like, you, you, according to the research, like, you, you can so for example, you can get sort of the sort of anxiety that comes about by by having a very traumatic experience. So you could be reasonably relaxed as a person, and and, and then as an adult, something really bad happens, like a car crash, or and then you develop like panic attacks and really bad anxiety. Mine was more like. I guess you call it classic anxiety. I don't know what the name is, but like it's a it was a gradual thing. Like I was I was always what's the trait? Um, neuroticism. Uh, neurotic. Neuroticism, right? Yeah. So I, I was probably I'd probably be classed as quite high in neuroticism. Yeah. But then, you know, it, it's not. It wasn't until I took over the business that it, everything became very overwhelming, and then it, you know the hypervigilance starts and all that stuff and the worry is just and it just it just like spirals. And that's, that's how I ended up, you know, I just got more and more and more anxious and just, I was a bit of a bag of nerves, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I, I get you. And then the the other thing about anxiety is that your anxious brain tends to collate and group everything together. So um, there's, there's the, the negative side of that is that when you get anxious about one thing, your, your brain can, that's what agoraphobia is, isn't it? When people don't leave the house. They're anxious about everything happening at the same time, almost, and then you just become uh, isolated and secluded to your own space, both physically and metaphorically. But the great thing about that is it also works in the other way, which is that if you can overcome one fear, you don't just overcome. It isn't just that you get less afraid of that fear; is that you get less afraid in general. So it's it's a sort of it's a damning report and also a, a auspicious indictment in that if you let, not let, because I don't like using that word, but if things can, if the anxiety can get the upper hand, sometimes you can feel like your world is closing in on you. But at the same time, if mm -hmm. you push back at it, face what you're afraid of in a controlled manner, the world actually opens up to you in, in, in a myriad of ways. And that's what, there's a, a great psychologist called John Peterson. Um, I'm sure you've probably mm. heard of him. He talks about, he says that people don't, through therapy, they don't get less afraid. 
they get braver and they're and, and it's actually a far better uh thing to be become braver than it is to become less afraid because it's it's applicable to multiple aspects so that's the sort of thing that with anxiety which can be quite condemning i suppose but also uh hopeful do you, do you get that does that resonate with you yeah very much so i mean like i don't know if you've seen the video the the reel i did on tiktok but because i'm not coming which one you you've seen but the one i have pinned is is is, is something about neuroplasticity yes yes yeah, yeah. and the neuroplasticity one like, it's quite a big thing now but like everyone kind of knows about it but really it means that you know these things act in spirals. So if you start on a downward spiral of negativity or anxiety, or whatever, because you're using those networks a lot, they get stronger and they dominate. But the same is true as, you know, positive things. So if you, this is why, you know, I think it's really good for, to meditate because it's like going to the gym to be happy or gra grateful or whatever it is. If you're doing that half an hour a day, really it's like strengthening the muscle or that network, which is responsible for you feeling peaceful yeah. or gra grateful or calm or happy whatever it is you know yeah. um so yeah it can work in 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 either direction yeah. um because yeah it's interesting because there's also sorry go on. no no carry on you but you go well i know i was just going to say that there's also this um theory of hmm, the name escapes me uh something susceptibility where, where basically some people are more sensitive to neuroplastic changes like that. Mm -hmm. So they might be more susceptible to anxiety or negative things like that, but they're all they're the same people that mm -hmm. these tools like meditation, they, they work better for, they're more sensitive to. Oh, that's so if they're doing the good things, they can get really happy. Do you know what I mean? So it's a kind of like, it can be a good thing as well if you're sensitive. Yes, definitely. Oh, I, um, so is that, does that tend differential to differential susceptibility is what it's called. <laughs> it's yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Does, does that tend to, um, exist in people that are anxious or is it not, is it, is it anyone, anyone? Like, well, according to the theory, according to the according theory, to the theory oh, like, wow. it just like the, sorry, you're on. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem with a lot of psychology and, and research into this stuff is, is almost always another piece of research which questions it, <laughs> almost without exception in psychology. It's, it's a really difficult thing, and it's the same with differential susceptibility. You know, it, it was like one of these things that everyone believed in for years, and then reasonably recently someone's come and said, oh, I'm not sure about this anymore, but, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's difficult. It is. That, that is, a, I suppose, because psychology is a social science. Um, Mm. it's well uh, even even the biology you know even the, the yeah it, even the neuroscience like you, you you come up with a paper and then two years later they've decided that it's not it's not the case anymore yeah. <laughs> but you know you wow. just gotta do your best and... i suppose what, what does that what does that tell you about well one thing it tells you that if you um execute a study with different variables you're going to get a different outcomes maybe it all it's quite isn't it ironic that two studies on neuroplasticity come out with different um sort of reach different conclusions almost to say that the fact that there's differing outcomes is ironic in that there's differing outcomes with the neuroplasticity so i don't know i don't know maybe i'd have to look yeah i mean i don't mean to, i don't i don't know in in that exact like thing i don't know what the measurements were and things like that yeah i just exactly. you know i don't i don't generally when i read papers i read the abstracts and <laughs> i don't go through the whole thing yes. most of the time right so I, I don't know what the what the variables and stuff were but i think really if you want to put it in basic terms it it the humans are just unbelievably complex yeah that's exactly so yeah, and like you know, and I always think about when I think about research studies like that. I always think about diet and nutrition. Like, you try and follow that; it's almost impossible. Yeah, there's yeah. always a contradictory paper to whatever you say. You know, don't skip breakfast. Skip breakfast. Eat meat. Don't eat meat. Exactly. You know? <laughs> um, the only thing I can really say about that is, yeah, yeah. No, what what, what can you say about that? 
Well, no, I mean, when it comes to diet, because there's so much contradictory stuff there, I generally stick to just the old fashioned stuff, like eat, eat, eat more plants, eat more colorful things, cut out fast food and, and sugar and processed food and really can't go much wrong with that. No, yeah, I think that is, when you get into the minutiae of detail about grains and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, one thing is for certain is that the, the food map that we that I was taught at school and I'm sure you were taught at school um, is, is a lie, is, is a fallacy to, to some degree in the sense of we don't need that many carbohydrates. But you're, the, mm. there's the, the proliferation of the diet, the diet sphere in recent years is just completely blown up. What what is likely is that we're in lots of ways we're at this weird stage in um sort of society where we haven't reached the point of specialization and in, and sort of uh, individuation in that one day some will be able, you know mm -hmm. I think there's there's this new thing called Zoe isn't there that I see advertised and i think maybe okay, that, you stuck on your arm yeah you think that you stick on your arm i think that's maybe moving towards that that uh, uh specification yeah. um but it's the same with all sorts of like skincare products and things like that we're all sort of stumbling around in the dark and then the person that can come along and say look at some set of data from an individual and go you need to do this this and this that is when well, that's obviously where the money will be made and the progress will be. Yeah, so that when I got that book from that woman who was running the the MBSR course, uh, it was a yeah the the um, the Buddha's brain, neuroscience, meditation, and the mindfulness of that. I read that and I was just blown away. I was like, this is this is just like gold for me. I just really really couldn't get enough of it. So I read and read and read and read. Like I said, I was doing these workshops. I was giving these workshops, and then I felt a bit of imposter syndrome because I didn't really have any direct, directly relevant qualifications. So I did the masters, um, which I really enjoyed. I learned a lot, an awful lot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, and then yeah, and then I, I got all these answers, and I, you know, I did thousands of hours of research um, because I loved it, and I was, you know, trying to cure myself essentially. And then I just felt it was like a waste, of t a waste, kind of wasted knowledge, just to leave it there, sort of gathering dust on the shelf, as it, you know, metaphorically. So, yeah, you know, I, I like to try and educate other people and, and help other people as well. Brilliant. So you don't have to spend like thousands of hours doing it, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, fluff in between all that. Yeah, exactly. And they don't have to wait through all of the uh, excess. Yeah. Thing sort of separate the wheat from the chaff so to speak so exactly, yeah yeah how so what did you read in this book that was enlightening to you and that you weren't aware of beforehand can you name a couple of things well it, it was it was yeah it was probably at least 10 10 11 years 12 years ago maybe so it's a while back so but i just i just to me and I, it's probably a bit old hat now, but to me, it was a real revelation that the whole neuroplasticity thing, because mm. there's another book that he wrote, Rick Hansen, um, called Hardwiring Happiness. And it's really just practicing using those networks. Um, it's fighting the negativity bias, really. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, that whole revelation that you're not set in stone, you know, as a person, you don't get to like 20 and that's you done. Yeah. Like you, ch you, you can change it's not quite as easy as when you're a child, obviously, but you can yeah. grow and it will be whatever you want to be. Really, you can. Like, yeah. And I have changed an awful lot since I was like, I was always really angry and really stressed and really anxious. I'm very, very rarely like that now, almost never. That's brilliant. Now, to be fair, um, I've been sort of recently, I've been having a little bit of an internal dialogue um, about, because I'm, I'm very, not very, but I, I don't really like these I, this idea of societal construct, uh, just because I think I feel like we it's become slightly more damaging than helpful. And I, I was sort of um, flirting with the idea of ver sort of very biological determinism, but then I, I obviously thought about not specifically you, but I thought about 
examples of people that could change their lives. And obviously what is the case is mm. that we're both biologically um, determined and also individually, individual autonomy. And I think it, it's empowering. People think one of the, one of the sort of criticisms we've leveled at like determinism and biological determinism is that it takes autonomy away from you. But I actually think society, mm. there's just as much, there's just as much a lack of autonomy with the, if you subscribe to the notion of um, societal construction as there is if you ascribe to the notion of biological determinism. But what I think is definitely true and is very, very uh, encouraging is exactly what you've spoken about there, the capacity that people have to completely change their, to change their personalities. Uh, because, what, you know, to use a sort of uh, slightly morbid example, with drug addicts and alcoholics, um, maybe alcoholics slightly less, because alcoholic, alcoholic, alcoholism really is a, is a bastard. Um, but with certain drug addictions, once people overcome, people think that it's the sort of biological and chemical connections, not connection, what's the word? Um, uh, it's dependency that causes, yeah, dependence mm. that causes most of the issue with um, drug addiction. But it's it's not actually. It's the it's the neural networks that you program and hard. Who you know? Who is it? Says um, something that someone says something that pro, neurons that fire together wire together. Or, um, I think it's Joe Dispenza. Mm, Hebbian, sure. yeah, yeah, something like that. Well, so uh, that's Heb Hebbian. It's called Hebbian theory. Because okay. he's the guy who discovered neuroplasticity, but he didn't come up with that phrase. That's um, a woman. I can't remember her name, but um, they should they should give her more credit because they oh, always yeah. say it's Heb, it's Heb, it's not. <laughs> oh, I didn't know uh, that. Actually. Yeah, they should they should give her more credit. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Um, apologies to her, um, but it, it, it's these these neural pathways, and and you know you'll know more than I do, but it's believed that there's actually no way of eradicating these neural pathways what what seems to be what it looks like happens is that stronger ones just grow over the top of the old ones and what you'll find a lot as as you'll know is that when people get stressed they tend to default to some probably um uh, maladaptive behavior that they that they've developed earlier on or, and, and that's because when we're stressed, we lose our maybe willpower is the wrong term, but we lose our the reserve that we have. We we, we default back to our maybe maybe that's not true, but, but but you do tend to find that when people get stressed, they resort back to something. No, that, I mean, yeah, you you, the, you uh, there's there's some there's some not neuroscience theory behind that, and and that's that when you're stressed, you. There's a kind of balance, it's, this is very oversimplified, but there's a kind of balance in your yeah. hippocampus and your amygdala when it comes to nuance, right? So the hippocampus is good at putting things in context. That's kind of its job, it's, it's one of its jobs. Uh, whereas the amygdala is like, you know, but everything's black or white. Yeah. Screw the context. You know, we, we're in survival mode. So we, and when you get stressed, it basically shuts down the hippocampus to some extent and it activates the amygdala. So that balances all out and you, all the nuance goes out the window, everything comes black and white and you revert to, like you say, you revert, you revert to like whatever survival mechanisms you've got. And if you're an addict, that that's, you know, how do I numb this pain? Drink booze or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of, yeah. Okay. So that, that that's, yeah. that's what happens. So, did can you did you see that cropping up in your own life? Like, what was it for you that your amygdala went, "Let's do this," and your hippocampus was maybe trying to go, uh, "Hang on a minute." What was your vice? Yes, I, I mean that is. Sorry. What was your vice? I know that's if that's too personal, then that's my, my vice. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, because it's all escape. It's, it's all is escape. Escapism. Yeah, is one word, but maybe a better word is is um dis distraction. Whatever. Um, 
it's it's to, it's to it's to numb some sort of pain normally um and my distraction was worry actually a lot of it weirdly enough that's that's part of that you can kind of get addicted to worry because your your brain lies to you it says if you really worry 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 about this or try and get as much information as you can so that nothing you can control everything everything will be okay and obviously that's not true because <laughs> it's not how it works so there was that but also i i used to game a lot um so playing card games on, on online and way back i used to play call of duty and stuff like that and just shut away yeah. Um, yeah. That that um yeah the capacity to sort of uh, enter another world, isn't it? And uh, escapism is a good term, but another what's a, actually said distraction. But there's an even there's an even stronger word, which is sort of uh, uh, like fetal position is or burying your sort of burying your head in the sand is and just just to escape mm. the the chaos that is surrounded surrounded by um, in your in your external life. So yeah, in, in um, yeah. sorry, I just create in 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 this uh, something I really like in in a, a, a method or methodology. I don't know what you call of of a type of therapy is called internal family system. I don't know if you have heard of it, but it's basically that your inside of you is lots of little different parts, and they're all trying to take over the system to get yeah. to what they want and um and when they talk about things like addiction and distractions they call them um firefighters and it's kind of protective mechanism just to just to douse everything down you know and numb you yeah it really yeah like so it really and and they call it a protective mecha a protector because they don't essentially it's they're trying to protect you from those feelings of pain yeah it's interesting that isn't it that the the so we talk about the mind and the body as one we've we've moved away from the i think it's the biopsychosocial model or that's what we've moved towards one of them was that the brain and the body were two separate entities just connected to each other and then now we've moved to the idea of them being in uh, a union and it's interesting, you know, you, the way you articulate articulated it there, the brain, which is in theory connected to the body, so should be con sort of in um, communication. Maybe that's not the right way of putting it, but it prioritizes the amelioration of immediate pain over preventing possible long term pain. As in, the default isn't to yeah, think. Yeah. I shouldn't drink now because it's going to make me worse. Yeah, yeah. The default is to think, mm. no, 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 drink now because you feel bad. So, you know, why mm. would a, why isn't, I suppose, why isn't our body with sort of, we, I, and I, I, that comes down to the fact that our survival isn't, fundamentally, our survival isn't guaranteed. So there has to be kind of an emphasis on, the here and now, doesn't there? Because saying, yeah, yeah. because, you know, that's where greed and things like that come from. We've evolved to be greedy because it wasn't guaranteed that we were going to get to eat in the, you know, tomorrow. We had to eat as much as we can now. Right. And, an, and a, an offset of that is this hyper fixation on, well, it's actually not. Well, it is because in some ways it is but also a lot of people don't fixate on the present they're too occupied with the external so the the brain and the body tend to make uh pretty uh unfortunate mistakes maybe from a certain perspective at the wrong time when they you want them to do one thing but they do the other and um that leaves it up to us to rectify that yeah, I mean, there's a good analogy that some of the guy who taught me EFT or tapping is a really cool guy called Josh Matthews Morgan. He he um he taught me this analogy once of it's like a an elephant on an an elephant rider on an elephant. So you you got your top down stuff saying that understands you know logically in the future it's not good for us to drink right. 
But emotionally, the elephant is the emotional side of you or the emotional brain, as yeah. he called it. Um, you haven't got a chance. If, 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 that, if, if the elephant doesn't want to go there, it's no good saying, right, we've got to do that. It's like, no, I don't fancy it. You're completely at, 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 the, at the mercy of its will. Um, which is why I really like what I really like when I'm coaching is, is to find out what someone, what, how, how they want to feel. You know, that's what, at the end of the day, that's behind everything. You know, what, why do you want a car? Why do you want the money? What, what's it for? <laughs> and behind all of that, it's something else. It's something because they want to feel differently, yeah. whether it's secure, safe, loved, admired, you know, whatever it is. And, be, and behind all of that is a subconscious emotional learning, which is, which is completely separate to what you think, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're, you're being driven by uh, subconscious implicit learnings, yeah, which are emotionally exactly. based. It's uh, yeah. I, I, I like that analogy a lot. It's the, the, the um, sort of uh, extension on that analogy just came to my mind as you were talking. So Freud came up with the whole idea of the id, the ego and the super ego. Uh, and the, what you could imagine that the the ego is no the, the it is the elephant and then the super ego is kind of like this uh i don't know maybe sort of uh victorian exceptionally upper, um, aristocrat who's saying oh, i want to do this i want to do that and you're getting this wrong and you're getting that wrong and then you're the driver and you're just you're trying to appease the elephant, and then you're also trying to appease the um, the aristocrat who's saying this is wrong and this is wrong. Um, and the ego is you because he thought that the id was um, like all our dark desires and all our sort of story. It's slightly different to what you're talking about. You're talking more about subconscious. Um, and then the the super ego was the judge that was sort of judging everything that we did that can become exceptionally damaging if people have a, when people have an overdeveloped or a, a, a tyrannical super ego, their lives can become quite difficult. And then you're the ego, you're the yeah, guy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm, yeah. Personally, I, 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 I'd prefer to take the stance of you're all of it. Yeah. You know, it's all you. Yes. You know, yeah. there's no, and and I think sometimes we can over identify with a part like a, a a logical part or a you know and that's what I think most people do they over identify yeah. with this thinking part and we get just we get dismembered from the feeling and the, and you know and this is how I think I got ill and I think a lot of people get ill chronically ill is they they disengage and really they have to get back to listen to themselves it's like their emotional side and, and and you know you learn a hell of a lot like if you go into your subconscious and you delve into there you wouldn't believe the stuff it knows that you don't think you know yeah yeah it's mad why do you think they disengage what do you mean by that i don't know i don't i think um i think modern st stuff doesn't help like the way we are now, I think, if, you know, if we were cavemen, for example, we'd spend a lot more time just sat with ourselves mm -hmm. and listening to our body and our emotions. How do we feel? What does that mean? Now, I, I, I'm not saying everyone, but I think a lot of people, they just, they feel a, 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 an emotion they don't like, like anger or anxiety, and they try and push it away. And part of pushing it away could be, intellectualization a lot of people do that's what i used to do just try and learn more um try and you know sort of logic it away or through booze or whatever you know but you know when you come home to it and you really understand what all this stuff is trying to say it changes a lot it's it's, it's quite enlightening so what what so ex expand on that as in when you sort of when you understand what what becomes enlightening. Well, when you understand, okay, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Like, like I spent a, a lot of my t time. So, a lot, if if um if you're angry, and for most people, not always, obviously, it's always, but for a lot of the time, anger comes from 
a, a, a resentment and a lack of control, not standing your ground, and it's kind of pent up, and, and you and you firing into the wrong directions. But if you if you if you took the time to sit with your anger, and <laughs> like literally ask it, connect with it, ask it, what do you want? What do you want from me? It's funny, it tells you. Your subconscious, without trying to figure it out, just ask it and wait for an answer whilst you're connected to that feeling, an answer normally comes. And it yeah. says something like, you're letting someone walk all over you. Do something about it. Why haven't you done anything about it? Why are you pushing me away? Yeah. Well, and, and there's, yeah, there's a million... Sorry, go on. You're kind of talking about you, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but have you seen the film uh, Inside Out, the, the the Pixar film? No, no, but I've heard I've heard that it's very similar to our internal family system. It's, it's like you know you've got angry part and it sad is. part, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Right. And the, um, the people who like AF, IFS love it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've spoken about this on a podcast before. The and uh, the sort of uh, the classic classical or representation of emotions in the sense of historic so the Greeks and the way that they basically the idea of using gods to categorize and to describe emotion is actually a far more phenomenologically accurate way of doing it than the way we currently doing it, do it so you know that people used to say that we were the playthings of the gods uh, because we would become yeah. gripped by these emotions and these desires, and they would. It would the only if the only plausible poss possibility was that a god was controlling us because they were so powerful, and we obviously didn't have any mm. conception of chemical or of of the brain and everything. We didn't think it was possible conceivable that this could all be a result of something that's going on internally because we had no idea that we yeah. could create such a powerful um it was possible to do that and i think we 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 sort of dismiss uh, that the idea of that sort of ideology as being prehistoric and being uh naive but actually i don't think it is as naive as uh, people think it is. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially when people are under the grip of certain emotions and certain ways that they're, they're so powerful and they can be so corrosive mm. that, and um, sort of prosperous and, and, you know, beneficial, that it would make sense to think that it is something that's not entirely with us. So I'm going to have to look at, what's it, what's it called? IFS. In yeah, internal family systems. Yeah, family is um. I mean, there are internal internal family systems. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I, I train in vo voice dialogue, which is another parts based um kind of modality, but it's very similar. I just prefer IFS. I read a lot about it since. I was like, actually, this is this is better. <laughs> So what have you read that you're particularly, obviously that, but are there any topics that you're particularly interested in and maybe things that you think people really should know about that haven't entered the mainstream? Anything come to mind? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I It's funny because it's hard to know from my position what, because what I, what I find myself doing quite a lot is thinking about something I'd like to inform people about, like on a video or something or on my podcast, but I find it hard in, you know, in the word, if you like, to know what other people don't know. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know what, you know, I have to try and guess because it's very easy for me to say, oh, everyone knows that and just don't bother with it. But then I'll say to my wife, and she goes, no, no, most people don't know that. So it's, it's really hard. <laughs> it's difficult. But I, I would definitely say that, you know, I don't know. There's so many things I could say, like, when you talk about anxiety earlier, I think, and, and how sort of, I think you're talking about agoraphobia and stuff. And the answer is, I think Peterson said it or someone, or Jung, like the answer is through the difficult stuff. And, and, and when you've got anxiety, 
the only way out is through. You can't, the more you say to yourself, when like I said this on my podcast, like one, one thing that I find a bit upsetting is if I hear a young person say, I've been to the doctors, they've still got anxiety, so I, I can't do that. It's like, no, no, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. If you've got anxiety, you need, you need to do it even more. I know it's not easy. God knows, I, I know that. But it really is the truth. And it, 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 and it might have to be very gradual, but the answer is more, not less. <laughs> really it is. Um, so that's one thing I'll definitely say. Um, and, the other, and the other thing I would say is, is really as well is, is, is it's been a bit of an eye opener for me over the last I don't know, for three or four years is, is, is the mind, is the whole mind body thing and the emotional side of thing. The, the fact that you can connect because there's a big thing about CBT and top down stuff and you can't sort, you can't really engage with emotions. So you have to do everything through logic and thoughts and behavior. And I don't believe that at all. I think they are important, but I think you, you can do a lot of work with your emotions and connecting with them and letting your subconscious because your subconscious and your emotional brain have a different language. You can't just talk to them like you would normally and have sort of a logic argument. You have to just sit with them and feel it and, and, and pay attention and ask. And it, it, in the right circumstances, it will just tell you, it will tell you everything, it'll tell you why you're anxious. It will tell you why you're angry. All the, all the things you think, you know, you, you don't know the answer to. Yeah. So, so what you're kind of alluding to is, is another one of my favorite topics that to talk about. Um, First thing I think you're, you are absolutely spot on about uh, the answer is more. My favorite quote out of every quote I've ever heard is Jung's quote where he said, that which you most need will be found where you least want to look. It's, I think it's just exactly that, yeah. it's, it's, it's so true that it's almost inexpressibly mm. the case. And, mm. and it, it comes I love back. Jung. Yeah, I agree. Jung's phenomenal. Absolutely, beyond genius. What a, what a gift. Uh, mm. So, you are right that it has to be through. And as you said, if you can make that, and that's what that's what um, that systematic desensitization from a like a, yeah. a clinical view, isn't it? That's that's what they call it. And it and it goes back to what I was talking about earlier in that you don't get less afraid, you get braver, and that extrapolates yeah, out well, all aspects of your life. Yeah, and what I'll also say, reminding me of what you were talking about earlier, is there there are two ways out actually, and one is known as extinction, which is what you were describing, where your fear networks are there, and then you gradually expose yourself to the spider, whatever it is, and then you learn, you lay down new networks that say actually spiders are safe, and with yeah. enough practice, this dominates. So the yeah. fear kind of just goes out in the background, and and the spiders are safe is the dominant one and that's what you feel there's another way of doing it called reconsolidation memory reconsolidation and that is um essentially what things like ifs um try and do there's another thing called coherence therapy which i really really love and that that is about connecting with your feelings finding the very specific subconscious learnings that are responsible for your anxiety or whatever these things you don't want are and replacing them literally you rewire them but you have to it's, it's a lot more specific you have to find the exact learning which might be something like it takes a little while to unroot but it might be something like um my father didn't show up or my as you have to say in the present tense my father doesn't show up to see me he'd rather see his friends that means there's something wrong with me and that's what that's how weird it sounds, because all these implicit memories of those are the ones that are driving you every day as an adult, but they're generally, you know, formed as a kid. And and when you find them very specifically, you can let go of them using different techniques, and it literally rewires that then, rather than you know the two layers. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I get the um. I, d I didn't know they had proper names. I have to look back and research them because I, I did a bit of ET, um, EFT. I, I, I sort of trained in it and mm. got like a, a qualification, so to speak. Um, and yeah, what you said there, just the bit about the, the final, the latter example, 
it's kind of like when you do EFT, you or when you do sort of mm. reconditioning, you have to come up with a statement, don't you? Or at least that's what I, I, yes, I yes. You and that's the most that. important part, you know, as you'll know. Yeah, is that the, the most important part, part of EFT is 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 the correct the one that hits you deep and hard and you probably start crying <laughs> and it doesn't make sense logically. And you're like, well, um, I remember my wife, like I did, I, I was learning how to uncover these, these, these subconscious learnings, emotional learnings, I call them. Um, and I said to my wife, like, she goes, oh, tell me how you do it. And I was like, okay, lucky because I know her quite well and you have to get there. So we got, it took like five minutes. And at the end of it, she had this thing where she felt bad if someone thought she was being out of line even if she, even if she wasn't, and we uncovered it. And at the, at the root of it all, what the sentence was something like, um, "If people think I'm naughty, I won't get invited to parties, and I won't have any friends." <laughs> and she started crying when she said it as an adult, and she's wow. like, what, "What? What? What the hell's going on?" <laughs> and I was like, "That's that's it, and that's what you know." You and that that's when you tap on it, and and tapping actually is a really good. I use it to teach reconsolidation because it goes through the steps perfectly so the first step is unraveling uncovering that emotional learning and the second step is letting it express itself and that's when you're doing this and you're saying the same thing that sentence over and over again until it just out and out and out and it's expressed and it feels fully heard and then it's then there's a juxtaposition so you you you, you bounce that with something that's contrary but you don't argue you just put it out there and then eventually, you, when the brain's like, oh, the brain's basically uh, lets go of those, they're called hippocampal templates, the memories, the emotional learnings. And then you can you can replace it with the truth or something that's better or nicer, like there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. You know, and you, you know it because you've done it in practice, right? Yeah. Well, no, that's a great story, yeah. It, and it comes back to this sort of the importance <laughs> The importance of childhood, isn't it, and how um, those those developmental years where we're where our brains are like sponges, and how we're continuously learning about ourselves and the world, but we're actually not. I think I read somewhere, or the, the reason, one of the reasons why childhood trauma is so traumatic, one of the myriad of reasons, is because as a child, you you you're you have some theory of mind, so you can kind of understand the idea of other, the concept of other people, but it's limited. So therefore, anything that bad happens, you have to reflect it back on yourself because yes, you, 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 you can't do anything else. And that's why that's yeah. why the, um, the so corrosive in later in life. Because so, yeah, I so when I I've spoken to people. I always think that one of the, one of the first steps to overcoming a negative experience in childhood should be the recognition that you're no longer a child, because we we get stuck, don't we? Yeah. What, as you said, in, 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 yeah, yeah. emotional mind. Our emotion. We get stuck in our uh, previous versions of ourselves, and we carry them with us into Abby. You know, mm. we become the inner child. Yeah, because because you know it's a bit of an oversimplification game, but those emotional learnings that really you could call them the inner child, little separate kind of inner children, they don't. There's no concept of time. My dad doesn't come to pick me up. He rather sees friends. Therefore, there's something wrong with me. What's wrong? You know, what's wrong with me that he doesn't want to see me? It's still there, as strongly then now as it was then it's just in the background and it's you know when you get rejected it's like oh what's you know it's because there's something wrong with me it's all there it's all <laughs> all these triggers and all these emotions it's, yeah yeah so that they that is would that come to the idea of they just sit on top of each other you you've built up a new <laughs> neural network Uh, how do you mean when you let go of it or well wait, you said it's still there so are you implying that that feeling's still there but you've oh, been able to overcome that feeling or have you not been able to overcome that idea well, if you have then you then like I say there are two ways you can you can do it 
by um, new new networks that dominate. So you can do lots of things that make you feel good about yourself. You can do the inner work in, in terms of building up the contrary networks, if you like, or the anti-correlated networks, the ones that make you feel good and happy and, and um, confident and self-worth and all that. Or you can reconsolidate it and go to that very specific memory uh, or learning, the meaning you made out of it, and and update it. And you know, in tapping, you know, you know what that is. You go through it and you, you give the juxtaposition, you, all the different phases. Whereas in IFS, for example, you you actually you let your subconscious come up with that child version of you that's holding all this and all these beliefs. And you get you get it to look at you and you say, look at me, who do you think I am? And then it's like, I'm not really sure. And it says, hold on, that, you're me. And you go, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, how old do you think I am? And it's blown away. It, it, nine times out of 10, when you visit, you, you visit the inner child that you're trying to heal, it will, it will just, it's like, I can't believe it. You're 40 or whatever. Because it doesn't know. It doesn't know. Yeah. And quite often that's enough. It's like, oh, God, if we're 40, you can look after us now. <laughs> wow. Do you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> it's 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 absolutely bonkers when you when you get when you get into all. Uh, so, uh, I suppose another interesting thing is the because, because as much as these awful things happen to people and they're atrocious, the only possible silver lining not silver lining is is too much of a heart is too much of a sort of. Uh, exaggerated term but it's the idea that you can then help other people and you you so just when you were talking about that the, the great thing about having these two things is you could almost talk back and they they can almost there's an interplay so someone that doesn't that never had that fear doesn't have the wisdom that they now have as a result of overcoming what it was they were once afraid of so it's almost like it's almost like a you can turn a curse into a gift, can't you? Because you now have the wisdom and the knowledge that came from do you, do you understand what I mean? That came from overcoming that fear. You can you have both. I think so. Yeah, I think like personally, and this 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 is a very personal preference of mine. I'm not saying that everyone should feel like this, but I feel like I, I've got a coach at the moment who's getting me over the last ten percent of CFS. I'm pretty much over it, but I wouldn't do. I wouldn't go with a coach who's not had it themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been through it. They, they they know exactly what it's like. They know, uh, and and you know, this coach that I'm with is, has had it and she's over it and she's helping me. And I'm you know, I've gone from eighty percent. I'm nearly. I'm probably ninety percent within three weeks, and I'm I. I'm hoping to be a hundred percent in in another three weeks. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so yeah, because luckily yeah. I wasn't too bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, and if you could go back and change, would you would you change it? Or are you? Is there no. has, has the wisdom that's come out of it, and the new you that it's created? Given uh, birth to? Yeah, I mean, there there are probably. Th some things would change like yeah. you know, I'll do things quicker for example you know um but I remember the first time I recovered from CFS I I remember thinking to myself I wouldn't change this for the world because it's it's altered me so much as a person without getting the CFS without being pushed to the limit so absolutely desperation I had to do something I never would have and I would be an angry, anxious person for the rest of my life. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. So you're right. It, I'm weirdly, I'm grateful that I that I got CFS. Yes. Yeah. 